welcome to the Brock Interview Series with host Thomas S. Orwatt Jr. Welcome to episode number 95 of the Rock Interview Series. I'm your host, Thomas Orwatt Jr. It is March 1st, 2024. And for this feature, I have guitarist, songwriter, producer, Steve Brown of the band Trickster as my guest. During this interview, Steve talks about the new Ace Frehley record, 10,000 Volts, which he was the producer, musician, co-songwriter, and mastermind of. Steve goes into detail about the making of the record, discusses all 11 tracks, and reveals his future working plans with Ace Frehley. So let's get started. Here is Steve Brown. Before we get started, please subscribe to the Rock Interview Series. Hey everyone, welcome to the Rock Interview Series, and we have Steve Brown, who happens to be probably um, a person that a lot of people are talking about right now. Uh, Steve, we all know, uh, obviously, from the band Trickster. Um, he formed the band at a very young age, nine years old. They had uh, dominated MTV back in the 19, the late 1980s, 89, 90-ish, and um, pretty famous for that, played with some great bands. Um, he's done other things. He's, uh, subbed in for Def Leppard and played a, a gig in Buffalo on May 26, 2018, uh, with you Journey. Bet. Yes. Yep. Sold out show. I was there, Steve. Yep. And, so, um, and of course the thing that everyone's talking about right now and everybody that has a Kiss shirt has this record right here. Yeah. I have, I have this cover right here, hoping to one day get it signed by there you, you and Ace. So I yep. hope so. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this has been out for one week and yeah. I, I myself, I can't remember last time I've been so like invested so much time listening to a record. And it's not just because it's Ace and I'm a Kiss fan. It's because it fucking rules, man. It's a, it's a great record. I mean, every track is good. There's no filler on it. I even compared it to some of Ace's older stuff. Like after listening to this for like, you know, like, from Friday all the way to like, you know, yesterday. Or today is today is Friday, so it's been yes. out for like one full week. Yeah, I listened to I listened to some of Ace's other stuff, and um, you know, when Spaceman came out, I thought it was pretty good, but compared to this, I mean, it's it's it pales in comparison. So congratulations <laughs> for what you did, thank and you. as a Kiss fan, thank you for like bringing Ace back. I mean, it really brought him back to the forefront. Well, I mean, you know, thanks for having me on. Hi, everybody. Great to be with you. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been an incredible journey the last year and a half with Ace. And, you know, Ace and I, I, I have been friends for 30 plus years. And um, but it's over the last year and a half of making this record. We've become like, you know, best friends and brothers and and, uh, you know, a, a, an incredible songwriting and production team. So. You know, cheers to everybody. The response to the record has been overwhelming. There's, and what I love about it, and I, of course, I knew this was going to happen, the love for it, and there's also a lot of hate for it because there, I haven't seen this much sort of, let's say, controversy over a record in a long time so i'm happy to be a part of it you know uh 95 percent of it is all positive but even the negative you know what all you haters out there first thing all the hate that you do it just sells more records because people people are curious now and i love it because look what you said before as a kiss fan and as an ace fan I told Ace this the day we started working together, when we finished working on Walking on the Moon. Um, I said to him, I said, listen, man, I'm one of your biggest fans. I'm a huge Kiss fan. You, are, you and Ed Van Halen are the reasons that I started playing guitar. The You two guys and Kiss and Van Halen were the two bands that got me going in 1978. I said, if you trust me, I promise you, we will make the best record that we possibly can and it will probably be the best thing that you've done since your 78 solo record so um i really honestly in my heart i believe we accomplished that now the kiss world and everything all i've said for all along is 
I made this record. I brought in most of the ideas for the songs and stuff like that, but it was every idea that I brought in was as a Kiss fan and as an Ace fan. And my whole thing was I've listened to everything Ace has done since he left Kiss. And it's, again, I've said it before and I'll say it again, and I say it with love. There are moments of brilliance, one or two, maybe three great things on some of these records surrounded by a ton of mediocrity. So my goal, and Ace said this to me the first day we were working, we got done. He said, I want to make sure every song is great. And that was music to my ears because look, I told him, I said, listen, brother, I can't do anything if the whole record is not awesome. We're doing 11 songs. They're all going to be great, even the cover song and even the instrumental. And he was all about it. And we, from day one, we set out to make the record that we made. But in all honesty, in my heart, and I know Ace feels the same way, we exceeded all of our expectations. And the fan response all around the world has just been, it's been spectacular. So thank you to all the KISS fans out there, all the Ace fans. We love you. And again, like I said, I made this record. I helped, and Ace did too. When we made this record, we made this for all of us all and like i said as a kiss fan and as an ace fan this is not just for me and ace this is for the world this is for all of us fans who have kind of been like over the last 30 years man yeah there's some good things there but kind of miss the mark you know what i mean so this is this is for you guys okay so you mentioned that you know there, there are a lot of good things with working with ace because of the fact that you were a fan what were some of the challenging parts about working with ace um, I mean, the, the biggest challenge was scheduling, you know, and even though Ace lives 45 minutes away from me and we were working here at my studio, this is Mojo Vegas 6160, and Ace lives, you know, up the road about 45 minutes away in, in northwestern New Jersey at the Ace in the Hole studio, you know, he was touring a lot, I was touring a lot. So that creates, that was the biggest challenge, you know, because I mean, for me, look, I can get off a plane and I've done it before where I get off a plane from doing a weekend's worth of gigs and I'll go right to the studio or right to another gig. Ace is set, at the time when we started, he was 71, 72 years old. It, it takes him a couple days to recover. So it was like, you know, and he had a pretty busy schedule last year, especially, you know, when we were getting into the meat of the record, it was like, you know, every two weeks he had to go and it takes him a couple days to recover from the road. So that was really the biggest challenge. I mean, honestly, once we got to when he came here or I was by his place, every time we worked, we would get another song done. And so it was, you know, again, in this day and age, look, man, it's not the 80s, it's not the 90s where, you know, when we would make a record back in the Trickster days or the Freely's Comet days or, you know, we would, you'd have two months where you'd do nothing but make your record. You'd go live somewhere and it was 24 hours a day. That's just not the way this world works anymore. We have families, we have other commitments. You know, I mean, I'm constantly working on different jobs in my studio, whether it's, you know, writing in, in Nashville, country music or mixing TV stuff. There's a ton of stuff, you know, so um, that was probably the biggest challenge you know, and I mean, look, I'll be honest with you, you know, Ace, he's been making records for 50 years. So some days he would come here or I'd go there and he really wasn't in that much of a mood to do something. And I would have to, as a producer, you have to play the mental games with people. How am I going to get him? How are we going to get some work done today? So it would kind of be like, hey, man, you know, let's have some coffee. Let's maybe eat some food. Let's tell some jokes try to change the mood sometimes because again you know ace has been doing this so long but you know i will say that um no matter what the coolest thing and i think it is in it, it's inside the record that i hope all the fans and listeners hear is how much fun we had making this record because it honestly, like, I'm not bullshitting you. I'm not going to sit here. I have no time to bullshit and tell stories. 
it's the God's honest truth that 90% of the time when we were working, besides the 10% where we would have arguments like you do when you're in a partnership, making record and, be, and being passionate about it. Um, we had so much fun as guitar players, songwriters, singers, and it was just so cool to be sitting there and, you know, Ace telling me stories about Jeff Beck or, you know, Rodian for Jimi Hendrix or, you know, one of the coolest things was he told me a story about um, when Van Halen flew to, when Gene flew Van Halen to New York in 77 to audition for Bill of Coin. And um, he told me the story that when they were at SIR, I believe they were rehearsing for the Rock and Roll Over tour. And they came and Van Halen played on Kiss's gear at SIR. And Ace told me that, you know, once they started playing, Ace looked at Paul and said, we got to get these guys off the stage. They're too good, you know, and uh, lo and behold, you know, look what happened afterwards. You know, it wasn't meant to be that the KISS organization worked with Van Halen, but look what happened afterwards. But, you know, I never heard that story before. And there's, you know, some really some other sort of stories that I can't tell you, but just, you know, crazy stuff. And just so you know, for the eight-year-old kid in me, the nine-year-old kid from Paramus, New Jersey, it was never lost on me. Like those pinch me moments where I'm going like, I can't believe this. I'm sitting in Ace Fraley's studio and we're making a record, you know, and it's really, you know, again, it's my life has been like a rock and roll fantasy and I'm, I'm so blessed and every year new and newer adventures happen to me and uh it's uh it never gets lost on me so thanks to everybody out there for giving me a career you know <laughs> yeah, it, it, as far as this goes you being so involved with this record where, where does it rank in your like career highlights it, i mean i would imagine it'd be pretty close to the top right of course man i mean you know i've it's definitely one of the proudest moments of my career to work with one of your heroes you know look man i've been blessed in the sense that i had a 30 plus year phenomenal friendship with eddie van halen you know i'm still really tight with alex i talk to alex all the time and uh, long story short you know toured with kiss um friends with john bon jovi and the bon jovi guys Def Leppard, they're like my brothers. I met them when I was 17 years old. And then, you know, 20 years later, I wind up playing in the band and I've been the backup guitar player in Def Leppard for the last 10 years. I mean, again, it's just, it's mind blowing to me, but it's also, it's no accident, you know, the, the work, the talent and the drive and the you know, my, my abilities speak for themselves, you know, and I'm not here. I've seen some of the online comments on some of these podcasts and these video interviews that I do where, oh, Steve seems arrogant. Dude, I'm not arrogant at all. I'm just, I'm so enthusiastic. And if that comes off as arrogance or like, I don't have to brag about anything. I think again, the body of work speaks for itself. Go listen to everything I've done. Trickster, 40 Foot Ringo, Stereo Fallout, Tokyo Motor Fist, outside of Trickster, whether you like Trickster or not, there's a whole world of things that I've done, you know, outside of this that speak volume. So again, you know, it's just, um, you know, to get back to your question, sorry to be so long winded, but again, I'm so excited and, uh, you know, most importantly, I'm so excited for my friend, you know, Ace, that we made this great record. And, um, you know, again, the fans response to it and, you know, his label Monarch Heavy, this has been Ace's biggest, you know, it's going to be wind up and hopefully the, the charts next week when everything comes out that the world gets to see how real, really big this record is. And uh, again, just monumental and one of the one of the proudest moments of my career for sure yeah have you been getting um any other um requests to work with artists after this i mean like i said you like took ace and really brought him like you know back into not that he wasn't but as far as a record goes i mean with new material i mean people are real serious about this record and really most of the people love it and i think the people that are negative about it are people that just don't believe it 
and and believe and you know because you're reading rumors like oh it's ai generated vocals and and steve brown played all the guitars and all that other crap i think those are the yeah. people that are the negative ones that don't believe you know that ace really was a big part of this hey look ace was a huge part of it because ace had could say yes or no to everything we worked as a partnership and a team and he sings and plays on every song what was used is a whole nother story but at the end of the day he's there and it's his record every vocal i have videos of every session that we did of him singing everything i'm singing a ton of stuff you know i mean this is very much so my production inspiration it's no secret is mutt lang you know, I mean, I'm very much from, I grew up in that field. I've worked with Mike Shipley. I've worked with the Def Leppard camp. That's the way I make records. I've always been sort of a one-stop shop. For the last 30 years, I've been engineering, producing, mixing, mastering, whatever it is, all of my music, because I want that control. And very much like the way when you work with Mutt Lang, when you hear, it's very much like when Mutt Lang started working with Brian Adams, you remember on Waking Up the Neighbors, when everybody was like, wow, it sounds like a Def Leppard record. Well, no, it's a Mutt Lang production. So if you listen to Tokyo Motor Fist or the last two Trickster records, and you listen to the new Ace records, you are going to hear my production on it just like if you listen to bob rock or bruce fairbrown those great records from the 80s when you listen to slippery when wet new jersey dr feelgood blue murder you hear their stamp on it and wholeheartedly from day one even when i did the first rough mix of walking on the moon and we sent it into the label the label and ace and all of ace's camp were like this is what we want emphatically 200 percent so for the fans who go this is and that go back to destroyer do you know how much bob ezrin is on that and maybe some other people and it's no secret that all the kiss guys over the last 40 years haven't played on their records i could name I could go through 10 of the biggest bands in the world that a lot of the key members did not play on some of the biggest hits, did not sing on some of the stuff. There's all those, it's just the way record making goes. And I've seen those comments about, you know, I saw a couple and people were right on the money. This is very much, listen to Hysteria by Def Leppard or Pyromania. You know, Mutt is, has a huge hand in all of that, and that is my inspiration. But to end all of the bullshit that goes around this, this was my job that I was hired and paid very well by Ace and by Monarch Heavy to deliver a top-notch, radio-friendly, modern rock production that is a career defining record for ace freely that encapsulates all of his years 50 years and i believe that that's what we accomplished a hundred times over so there you go yeah uh, after that all i can say is yeah i agree <laughs> You know, yeah. dude, listen, most people get it. And honestly, man, I'm just so psyched that there is so much passion for this record. Good, bad, whatever. And the coolest thing that I've been seeing over the last week is in the comments on all these different things, because I'm, I'm intrigued. The coolest thing that I've been seeing is this record is really growing on me. And that's all I can tell everybody that if you have a problem with it and my biggest my sort of equation to all of that is in for the last 30 years his records have been so mediocre in my opinion production wise the mixes th they don't have that great you know so i think the fans have become used to sort of records that are, are good but they're not great. So when you hear this, I think for a lot of people, it's too much to handle, you know? And it's like, oh my God, this is, you know, I mean, again, I remember the first time I heard Hysteria and I was like, my ears were going, 
I've never heard anything like this from Def Leppard. You know, the, the, the jump they made from pyromania to hysteria was, it was fucking miles. You know, it wasn't like Van Halen 1 to Van Halen 2. This was a gigantic step. So I think that's where a lot of this comes from. But again, the majority of the coolest comments that I've seen are, it's really growing on me. And I, that, that's the sign to me of a record that's going to have a long haul. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I I'm really hoping that Ace is going to be including some of these songs in the set list. I'm going. I have a couple yeah. shows I'm going to see in the next uh, few months. So I mean, yep. like I said, I don't think there's a weak song on here. So I will. I would take any song from here, like you know, in the live set. What is your right right off the top of your head? What's your favorite song? Oh uh, well, I you know, I like the I like the title track, of course, and I kind of like it also because you know I've been hearing it a lot, and also. Uh, one of my friends was a co-writer on it, David Julian. Of from course, Buffalo. Yeah. yeah. Buffalo, so, one of Buffalo's finest. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I've known David for a while. Uh, he was in a band called The Last Conservative, which, um, you know, was a band that I thought was going to be the next Goo Goo Dolls in Buffalo. And yeah. uh, I don't know what happened, but it just, it, it didn't happen. And of course, uh, Fighting for Life is one that everyone likes a lot. You know, that's a that's another great song. Um, the fan that's but, become the fan favorite. Yeah, yeah, it has, and and blinded too. I like a lot. Um, I like I said, I like I like all the songs, and I I really can't always say that with a record, and definitely not with you know Ace's last stuff that he's put out over the last like decade or so. Totally, so. and that was you know again, and David Julian, yeah, you know what a great story there. A guy who sends me a message on Instagram, and I was kind of like you know okay man, you want a shot at the title, Rocky send me your shit, send me your music. And he sent me a bunch of tunes and I was fucking blown away. And so when we started working on this, I was like, man, I'm going to give this kid a shot. He deserves it. He's super talented. And, you know, 10,000 volts, I gave him the directive. We need something, you know, and I remember like going over the phone to him going, give me something like gank, gank, gank. We need, I, I remember telling him because I had the title and I go, I got this title, 10,000 volts. I want something that's like shock me, maybe like firehouse, you know, get, and he fucking nailed it, man. And just so happy for him. And, you know, there, there's going to be a lot more coming from us. And, you know, and he also co-wrote Cosmic Heart too. Yeah, right. Um, I know it's only been a week since the records come out, but has there been any talk about you doing another one with Ace? I'm sure he probably wants to do another one probably sooner than later, right? Yeah, well, we are, you know, we're already, you know, um, we're already talking about probably in the fall, we are going to have a deluxe edition of 10,000 volts, um, which is going to have uh, probably a couple live tracks and alternate mixes. There is an alternate version of Fighting for Life that, you know, Anton Fig is on the drums on that. He Anton, you know, one of the Ace's guy, as far as like a when working with Anton, it, and, you know, Ace told me he's the greatest drummer in the world and he can do no wrong. And it was such an honor to work with him. But with that being said, so Anton plays drums on 10,000 volts, Cherry Medicine and Fighting for Life. But on Cherry Medicine and Fighting for Life, originally it was recorded by Joey Casada, my good friend who plays with me in the Eric Martin Trickster Band and ZO2. Long story short, so the deluxe edition we're going to have the alternate version of Fighting for Life with Joey on drums because it's a completely different sort of drum thing, more straight ahead, you know. And again, Anton took it to another level, took it to that level that it needed to go, but Joey's version of it is great. We have an alternate version of Constantly Cute, which is phenomenal because Ace did a completely different guitar solo that I loved and I fought him until we redid it and ace did two takes of this incredible the solo that's on the record and uh, but we have the alternate version so there's going to be some really cool stuff some of the unfinished songs that uh he worked on with some other writers we're going to polish them up but there's going to be a deluxe edition and then next you know in the fall when the touring starts slowing down we're going to start working on origins three slash duets which is going to be it's going to be very different it's not just going to be this cookie cutter 
ace covers record. There's going to be some big surprises for that. So that's next. And there's talk of a possible live record, you know, like a real fan souvenir, double live record, sort of like ace, for, you know, ace alive, kiss alive, double, you know, a real fan uh, sort of souvenir type thing. And then, yeah, you know, we have, a, we, if we didn't get stopped by the record company, we'd still be writing, if you know what I mean. We were just we were just killing it, having so much fun. So there's a ton of new music, but you know, myself and Bruno Ravel, who mixed the record, Bruno from Danger Danger and The Defiance, you know, we're kind of the new uh, audio team behind uh, behind Ace now. So you know, the good news is all the audio files, you're gonna have the best the best sounding. Uh, product that's going to be coming in the next couple years but uh, and that's no dig on anybody else you know who's worked on aces records again man i you know i tip my hat to everybody you know and everybody has a different take on what is great in their book you know i just again my whole barometer towards everything again when you put everything up against you know uh, mutt lang and bob rock bruce fairburn records and those are your benchmarks you know, that those for rock records, it's, you know, it's a pretty high standard. And I think we came pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely did achieve that. So now, now finally, I've, I've been talking about going through the tracks. We're finally going to do it right now. So yeah, you've already mentioned, it. we've already mentioned quite a bit about uh, 10,000 volts. Um, David Julian from Buffalo was a co-writer yeah. for it. Um, also uh, on bass was a former or uh, our, our current trickster member also original trickster member uh, pj course. farley he was on yep. there um wh why, why did you uh, have a uh, pj play on that particular track pj is you know pj is one of the best rock bass players on the planet um a lot of people don't really know that but if you again you listen to the catalog of material trickster through all of pj's solo stuff and all the stuff he's played on for me you know um He's one of the, you know, I call him, he's like Hugh McDonald Jr., perfect bass player. I never have to tell him what to play. He knows. I sent him the track. I knew he'd be the perfect person because I played a lot of bass on the record, but I knew 10,000 Volts was going to be the first single and it had to be next level. And he put his bass on it and it took the song to another level. And, um, you know, again, that was it. And, uh, and, and 10,000 volts was probably the fourth song that Ace and I worked on. And every time we work together, Ace, he's a pro. He's been doing this a lot longer than I have. He got excited right in the beginning, but he would also hold back. And he'd go, you know, I'm still working with other people. By the time we finished 10,000 volts and we both looked at each other and we were like, dude, we have a magical chemistry together. And I told him, I said, this is your first single and this is going to be the new title of the record and he was both like he's like you know what you're right and so this was the song that really sealed it for the both of us that we knew we had something extraordinary and that our partnership was better than the rest if you will and then you know and then the rest is history so yeah. 10,000 volts kicked it off. And I think, you know, there are people who say we should have done this, we should have done that. But, you know, 10,000 volts to me is the, you know, the, the ace is new shock me. I think it's going to be an anthem that he can play for the rest of his career. Absolutely. And and it's also being played on Sirius XM, Hair Nation, which is the yes. probably the, first, the only song I've ever heard on Hair Nation that wasn't recorded in the like, like 1980s or 1990s. It fits right in. You know, again, that's what it's all about. It's a song, you know, if Ace, you know, I, I will say he is going to probably play another two or three songs off the record that we're, you know, working on for next month. But long story short, 10,000 volts, that song stands up against anything. If you play it on modern rock radio and Shine Down comes on right after it, it doesn't sound weird. And that was part of what the label and what Ace wanted. We want to be on active, you know, real rock radio. So if Disturbed is on and then 10,000 volts come on, it the production's got to stand up. It can't sound like 1977, you know? Sorry, folks. Yeah, and, and, and that, unfortunately, a lot, of the, a lot of the legacy bands that release new stuff, you, it, it's kind of like that. I mean, a lot of those those bands that do release, you know, after like, you know, like 10 years or whatever, you listen yeah. to it, everyone's just so happy that they released something that everyone 
everyone's knee jerk reaction is this is their best release in decades. And then after a couple of weeks go by, it's like, oh, maybe not. But I mean, it was nice that they put something out. But this, I think it ha has legs. And like you said, this is going to be one of his career best records ever, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. So the next one is Walking on the Moon. And from what I've read so far, that was a full song that you had presented to him, right? Well, not full. No, it wasn't. Oh. It was the first, it was the first idea. It was the song that got us rolling and that's for sure. And, um, I came over to Ace's house when we worked on it and 95% of the vocals that you hear on it, that's on the finished product of what we did that first day. Um, a lot of my rhythm guitars are left on it. I had Ace play some acoustic on it and, um, you know, um, the solo, some of the solo lines. It's a kind of mix of him and I. And, um, and again, you know, I've said this before, making res records is like making sausage. You put a lot of ingredients in and then I grind it up and sort of, I pick and choose, you know, what parts are going to be used, but you know, y you never want to see really how sausage is made, but you love to eat it when it's done, you know, but, uh, psh. and, um, but, you know, and then so we did it. We did the first day we worked together and I made a rough mix for him and he was freaking out. He's playing it for Lara, his fiance, and everybody was going, this is from, this is incredible. The next day he calls me up like at two in the afternoon. He goes, Steve, he goes, Steve, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. And I came up with a bridge because at the time Ace was really he was kind of obsessed with bridges. Every song has to have a bridge. And I'm like, nah, I'm like, dude, New York Groove didn't have a bridge. A lot of your songs didn't have bridges, but. He wrote this bridge and he recorded, you know, the no and any way you look at it, you know, I love his fate. He wrote that and recorded it on his own, but he couldn't chop it into what we did already. So he took like my session and copied the drums and looped it and he recorded his parts and did four vocals on his own. Like he told me how he did it. He would hit record and then run to the microphone and sing it. He like set the pre-record for a long time. And I got to give him credit. So yeah, he actually engineered that, but it was up to me to have to take it and make it fit into the song. And luckily it all worked out. And he was 100% spot on, which he was 98% of the time when he would say to me, Steve, we need another part or Steve, we need to edit that. His ability as a song, you know, uh, as, as a songwriter, he knew what was right. And most of all, he knows what's right for Ace because he's the artist. But yeah, he wrote and, you know, he wrote the bridge and he was the one, it was originally a different title, but he was the one who keyed into the key line walking on the moon. And originally that was the title of the record. And he came and said, no, it's gotta be walking on the moon. And that's what we did. And it was, uh, you know, again, it was a, it was a perfect decision, you know, that we did that and, uh, you know, a second single and everybody loves it and then uh the next song is cosmic heart which uh is another one that was uh it was the last song recorded for the record and uh yeah. david julian was also involved in that yeah and um great i love the lyrics in that in that right on that particular yeah. song that was you know it's very autobiographical you know ace Ace wanted a song that talks about his life, the good, the bad, the ugly, and this is about it. You know, Ace is a survivor, you know, um, 17 years sober, and um, at 73 years old, man, the guy's still singing his songs. You know, there's no backing tracks. The guy, look, is he what he was? Is he what he was in the 70s? Hell no, nobody is, you know, but he's up there giving the best he can. And that's kind of what this song is about. You know, he's got a cosmic heart. And at the end of the day, Ace still loves doing this. And that's also part of what this song's about. But, you know, we tried to do, you know, this, of course, it's no secret how much of a fan, you know, how much Ace loves Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin. So this is definitely a nod to the Zeppelin influence, as was Walking on the Moon. And, um, you know, another fan favorite. I mean, they're all fan favorites as far as I'm concerned. But this is one, and this one, like, I thought was like, I said to him once, man, this is a song, like, it almost sounds like Gene co-wrote it. Because it has that sort of, you know, it could have been, can you imagine like Gene singing this song? It has that 
old school kiss thing, but it's kind of like, it's, it's a little bit scary, a little bit eerie sounding. So I definitely could have, you could have heard this in my opinion on Destroyer with Gene singing it. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, then, then the next track is uh, Cherry Medicine, which is, oh, yeah. that, that was the third, third single from the record. Okay. Yeah. And and that's just a great like great riff, super super fun summer type of song. Windows yep. down, you know. Pop, total pop, and you know. And again, this is one of the things that we see. I mean, my favorite Ace stuff. I love his songs on Unmasked. You know, Talk to Me and Two Sides of the Coin. I think are two of Ace's greatest songs. And the songs are you know that are on the solo record. You know, uh, you know what's on your mind. You know, some of the poppier melodic stuff. So Cherry Medicine, I specifically wanted for the KISS fans to have something that was reminiscent of 2000 Man. You know, and I told them right in the beginning, man, we're going to start it out guitar. It's going to, the fans are going to key into it like 2000 Man. And, um, and he was immediately, and this was the song we did right after, um, we did this right after 10,000 Volts. And this was the song that really sealed it for the two of us, because when we got done with the rough mix of it, and again, Joey Casada was the original drummer on it. And then once we finished it, Ace was like, we got to get Anton on this. Ace played it for Lara and her daughter and her daughter's friends and a bunch of Lara's friends, the girls. And we all know in rock and roll, if the girls love the song, it's awesome. And in Ace's world, this was all he wanted to hear. And it was, you know, again, it was one of those songs, like I said, man, this is right up there. This could be a Green Day song. This could be a Weezer song. It's got that pop thing. And that's, you know, my big influence. You know, I wrote a lot of the melodies in it, and you could definitely hear that. That's me singing the high harmony in there. I'm playing bass on it. And um, again, it's just such a fun song. Very, to me, it's very reminiscent of the Dynasty, you know, unmasked ace that so many fans have been screaming so loud how much they love it. So, you know, again, and the, how great is the video, right? Video is awesome. Yes. <laughs> the video, yeah, the video is great. It brings back the 80s, the, the fun of the uh, 80s videos. Uh, the next track, song number five, is Back Into My Arms Again. And yeah. that's... Uh, that that was a song that was an older Ace song that you kind of discovered, rediscovered on YouTube while watching YouTube with Ace, correct? Yeah, it was crazy. We were working on 10,000 volts and I saw that, you know, the thumbnail of uh, Back in My Arms and it had Ace in the Unmasked costume. So I said to him, is this a leftover from, from Unmasked? He goes, no, nah, it's a demo I wrote with this guy, Arthur Stead in the 80s. And I played it. And by the time we got done with the first chorus, we both looked at each other and go, we got to re-record this, this song, this song needs to be on the record. So unbelievable song, um, really cool story about it. Um, and, and, you know, David Julian plays on this as well with me and Ace and uh, PJ um, plays bass on it. And Ace was demanded that he goes, tell PJ he's got a copy, whatever John Reagan, because when we were doing this, sadly, John Reagan, Ace's bass player, from Freely's comment and, and his dear friend passed away uh, while we were doing this. And this, um, the bass part, you know, uh, John played uh, the bass on the demo and he was uh, emphatic that this has to be exactly like John played it on the demo as a tribute to him. So props to PJ Farley, cause I told PJ, I'm like, dude, study this and he knocked it out of the park. And again, having Joey Casada, my brother, you know, Joey plays with PJ and I to have him play drums on this. He was so excited and he was going, dude, the Kiss fans are going to go nuts when they hear this. And it's been said the response to it's been great, but it's definitely, you know, Ace was uh, it was ve uh, very much a heartfelt tribute to uh, the late, great John Reagan on this one. Yeah. And, and as a producer, I give you credit because it doesn't sound like an old song. I mean, I would never guess that if I didn't read it on the Internet. Yeah, totally. I'm sorry. I just got I just got a phone call from my wife. It's, I have to take care of. <laughs> but like I said, probably getting a lot of calls from people that want you to produce their new record. Oh and... yeah, oh yeah. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't believe who's calling me now. <laughs> I know. I believe it. Fighting for life. The next one I yeah. mentioned that's one of my favorite ones. And like on online, there's been tons of talk about that being a favorite track. Yeah. Um, 
what was what was the magic behind that one that again that was you know i brought that idea in and it was me being a huge kiss fan and saying what do i want to hear on an ace record and this was it to me it screams 70s kiss and um it was the second song that ace and i worked on and it was a little tough convincing ace to get behind it because my original demo sort of work track, it really wasn't, I don't do demos really because everything that I do, like if I played it for you, it sounds very finished, but it was a drum machine. It sounded like Def Leppard because I used the Def Leppard samples that I have and it was very straightforward, you know, bah, cha, goon, cha, goon, you know, very much ACDC. That's sort of the, the way Joey played it originally, but Ace couldn't get past the drum machine. And I said, dude, this song, fans are going to go nuts. Like I knew it because I knew how, how I felt. We worked on this right after Christmas uh, in 2022. Um, you know, right at the beginning when we started working on the record, Walking on the Moon, and we did it. And I went up to his house and and I got him. And it was also a little higher for him vocally. So he was kind of like, I don't know how I'm going to do this live. I go, don't worry about it. Don't worry about live. Just sing your ass off and it's going to be awesome. And sure enough, he did it. And a couple tweaks here and there, we got to where it was. And again, he kept listening to it and said, we got to get Anton on this track. And uh, and I sent it to Anton and I said, dude, make, you know, do your magic on this. You know what to do. Add some of the 78 key moments of, of that record onto this. And he did just that. And when he sent it back, I was like, it's perfect. And it was magic. And it's the fan favorite. And we're actually talking about probably going to be the next single. And I think we're probably going to do a, we're going to do a video for it in the next two months. Yeah, it also kind of reminds you a little bit of Hide Your Hearts. Um, I've heard the, that as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, again, lyrically, you know, it, it's talking, it's very reminiscent of Aces growing up, you know, tough growing up on in the Bronx and growing up on the streets. So it's got a little bit of the, you know, Aces story in it. And it was very near and dear to his heart. He was very adamant about certain lyrics that we keep in. So, you know, that that's something um, that's something, you know, I have to always be as a producer and a um you know writer that i have to always be aware of that it's his record and you know again i had to there are certain battles i could not win you know but this was one where i think we 100 percent nailed this song yeah yeah you definitely did uh the next song is blinded and i'm, I'm not sure when you asked me what what my favorite songs were i don't know if i mentioned that but i i should have because i really like yeah. this song a lot and i and yeah. i like the uh the lyrics for this again um you know, very, it's about, you know, um, AI and, and how the effect that is having on sure. society and that, and, and it's, it's a real, it's a, it's a big deal. And it's a, probably going to be a big, big issue as we go on in life. Oh and, uh, yeah. It's... And, and again, this was originally the lyrics that I brought in. A lot of times what I do is I come in and like, I had like most of the chorus cause you're blinded but it was originally blinded by panic. And then Ace was like, no, he came to me and it's all him that he wanted a song about the perils of artificial intelligence. And it was all those lyrics, you know, 95% of them are all Aces. And again, I thought that was really cool. And another thing was Ace was the one who said, I want this to start out vocally, a cappella. And I was like, dude, that's awesome. I said to him, I'm like, yeah, like carry on your wayward son, like Kansas, or like you give love a bad name, Bon Jovi. He goes, I love that song. He goes, I love Bon Jovi. So I was like, yes. You know, and again, I tried to bring into this record a lot of things. What haven't you heard on an Ace record? And there are a lot of elements like that. You know, I don't, I think there's only one other song. I think he, Ace talked about the song that he wrote with Gene that starts out with, with vocals, you know, so it's really, really cool, but definitely a fan, another fan favorite, really kind of cool riff. I love Ace's solos, you know, and on this record, that was a real big thing. We spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time with Ace and we would sit here, me and him with guitars while he's cutting guitar solos. And I would say to him, try this, try that. And, you know, I wanted to get him back to those really structured classic style solos that he was so known for. And I think over the last 20 years, a lot of that's gotten lost, but I think we nailed it, especially on Blinded. That is a quintessential great Ace solo. Yeah. And of course the guitar solos throughout the entire album are just 
incredible. I mean, Ace at his absolute best. The next track that we want to talk about is the song, uh, which is kind of like a, a cherry medicine a little bit, Constantly Cute. And again, you know, uh, this one came about, the title came about Ace's fiance Lara, who is, you know, my, she's a fellow Jersey girl. We grew up together, love her dearly. She's like my sister. She's phenomenal. But long story short, she was out with Ace one night and they, Ace was hanging and she said, you're constantly cute. And Ace called me the next day. He's like, Steve, Lara came up with this great title, constantly cute. We got to write something. So I came, he goes, come up with something great for it. And I wrote something and it was double time. I wanted to do something like ballroom blitz or I want you to want me. You know, you're constantly cute. You look like a dream like that. And Ace couldn't get into it. He was like, it sounds too country. That was, yeah, it was really cool. And again, you know, like I was saying before, Ace did, you know, again, that's the cool thing about doing this, the creative process. And hopefully I think I'm going to try to do a mix with that other version because I just listened to it before. It sounds so cool because I wanted Ace to have because he never had that tempo, you know, bah, boom. you're constantly cute. You look like a dream. It's to me, it was awesome. He wanted something different where it was a groove and he actually broke out his old drum machine from the nineties and came up with the drum pattern that Joey Casada played on it. And so much fun. And Lara's also on background vocals on it. She sang on it and just such a fun song. And again, it's a feel good, you know, great arena rock song. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll, we'll hurry this up now because I, yeah. I don't want to take any more of your time. So uh, Life of a Stranger is next. That was a cover song that you decided yep. to do? Yep. That was a cover song. You know, like Ace said, all, all of his records have an instrumental and a cover song. So that was the one that he came to me. He had, you know, the outfield, Your Love, he wanted to do. And I was like, no way, we're not doing that. Even though I love that song, I play it all the time in my 80s band, Rubik's Cube. But I was like, now nah, we got to do something cooler. And then he's like, I got this other one from the movie The Transporter. Played me the song, and I swear to God, no sh bullshit, exactly what you hear on the record was exactly what I heard in my mind. And I'm like, we could make this awesome. We can make this like your stairway to heaven. We could make this like something off Pink Floyd. I wanted to do something timeless classic. Strings, keyboards, Ace is playing bass on it. He's great guitar, great vocals. And another thing, it's a song that has three modulations in it. Ace has never had that on any of his songs ever with Kiss or, you know, in his solo work. So, again, production wise, it's kind of the, um, you know, again, like our stairway to heaven off this record. Very unique and uh, so much fun. You know, again, it's a, it's, yeah. a, it's, you know, it's definitely a soundtrack song. We're, and hopefully this song, we're trying to get it picked up for a movie right now. Yeah, and and again, it, it fits perfectly with the record. Nope. You would have never thought it was a, a cover. Uh, up yep. up in Without the sky doubt. is the next. Up in the sky is the next track that was originally yep. called "Stranger Than Fiction." Was originally what mm -hmm. it was called. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I believe it was. Yep, and I, you know, it was again one of the. You know, Matt Starr played drums on it, and um, it was lurking around, and it was needed to be finished. So I, uh, I took it and, you know, came up, I said, man, we got to do, you got to do like New York groove type guitar thing. And I built the track up with what Ace and, you know, Matt had already done and Ace did some great guitar work on it. And again, very much like making sausage. I took the ingredients, mashed it together and up in the sky. And this is another fan favorite. Definitely one of the songs that is very reminiscent, could have been on the 78 solo record for sure. Mm -hmm. And then the final track is the instrumental that um, Ace has had on every single one of his records. Yep. Um, well, how, how involved were you in the instrumental uh, stratosphere? I was very involved. I brought this in, you know, again, it was what would I want to hear on an ace record and ace immediately made a bunch of changes to it ace came up with the idea of um of triple tracking the intro to make it he's like yeah we got to do something like this make that arpeggio let's make it like rock bottom like the rock bottom intro and i was like boom once he said that i was like forget about it you know we had the thing and and the original didn't have any drums so ace and i came up with the drum you know sort of it's drum machine but we both programmed it to give it you know this kind of cool atmospheric thing and you know and i just love his solo on it the guitar solo but it's i think it's a phenomenal way to end the record and again it's it makes it a classic ace fraley record 
And again, it's a career defining record because I believe in my heart, and again, as a huge Ace and Kiss fan, this record has bits and pieces from Ace's whole career. And, uh, you know, Ace and I have talked about it and he said, you know what, if I never make another record again, this record is my perfect way out, if you will. You know, and and I agree with him. You know, this could be the bookend for it all. Wow, that I I hope is not because I mean I'm it's so not, excited it's about. It's not going to be. I didn't mean to get down on it, but I'm just saying. Right. You know, if it is, but there's a lot more. I told you, there's a lot more to yeah. come. So, Tom, I got to roll, my brother. Steve, thank you so much, and congratulations. I mean, I want you to go out and have a couple, like have some beers to celebrate this great victory. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you deserve I'm, it, man. I'm, I'm five years sober. I'm on the sober train with Ace, so I'll Never have a mind couple then. Of, uh, seltzers, brother. But yeah, right. I'm celebrating a lot. I'm going to have a couple extra slices of pizza tonight. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thanks again, Steve. Cool. We'll, we'll talk, talk to you soon. soon. Okay. We'll, so hopefully we'll see you on the uh, Trickster Enough's Enough Pretty Boy Floyd tour. Yeah, sounds good. We got to get that to Buffalo. Hey, I know brother. there's a couple places close, but all right, Steve, take it easy. Thanks again. Thanks, man. Buffalo, Bye -bye. you rock. See ya. <laughs> see ya. Bye.